Those who do not know history are doomed to repeat it. Not the faux history that's being rewritten by the left, but empirically based history that highlights how a constitutional republic voted to hand over power to one of the most evil regimes in world history. So, is history about to repeat itself? It's time for some straight talk. I'm Bunker Bob Steinhagen, and this is The Bunker Bob Show. Welcome back once again to my fellow conservatives in Rockwall County and throughout the great Republic of Texas, where I suspect most of you are very familiar with the prophetic words of Sir Edmund Burke. Those who do not know history are doomed to repeat it. But it's the words of Alexander Fraser Titler, also known as Lord Wool Halsey, that demands a critical look and begs the question as to whether or not the great experiment that is America is sustainable especially in the face of recent actions that have all but eliminated free and open expression. Lord Wool Halsey was a Scottish judge, writer, and historian from the 1700s who expressed a critical view of democracy. He said a democracy cannot exist as a permanent form of government. It can only exist until the voters discover that they can vote themselves largesse from the public treasury. From that moment on, the majority always votes for the candidates promising the most benefits from the public treasury, with the result that a democracy always collapses over loose fiscal policy, always followed by a dictatorship. Titler goes on to highlight that the average age of the world's greatest civilization has been 200 years. These nations have progressed through this sequence, from bondage to spiritual faith. From spiritual faith to great courage, from courage to liberty, from liberty to abundance, from abundance to selfishness, from selfishness to apathy, from apathy to dependence, from dependence back into bondage. We find ourselves at a point in history that should alarm any American who still believes in truth, liberty, and the American way. However, even those who place themselves on the right side of the political spectrum seem oblivious to the reality that the freedoms we enjoy today are perilously fragile. Yet, all one has to do is take an unfiltered look at the current state of our nation, and one doesn't have to be a tinfoil hat-wearing black helicopter-seeking doomsday prepper to recognize that Lord Woolhousie's words are a looming reality. Now, when I posted Tiller's quote on social media several weeks ago, I received a curious message from an individual that took to splitting hairs with my post by highlighting that we were not a democracy, but a constitutional republic, where he writes, in two years, we can reset the outcome of the 2020 elections. However, Lord Wolhalsey generalized the term democracy and focused primarily on representative forms of government, which is why his statement reads, the majority always votes for the candidates promising the most benefits from the public treasury which reflects a democratic republic. Otherwise, he would have written the majority always votes for benefits from the public treasury without mentioning candidates. Well, Halsey wrote that he considered a pure democracy to be a monster, completely dysfunctional, which it is. But more concerning to me about the message from a very nice viewer was the reality that his sense of the changing political landscape is probably representative of most, hence my opening about those who do not know history. Like in America today, less than 100 years ago, citizens of the Weimar Republic basked in the false comfort of its constitution that, like our U.S. Constitution, guaranteed citizens fundamental rights like religious freedom, freedom of expression, peaceful assembly, the right to equal opportunity and earnings in the workplace, and the right to own property. In fact, German women were given the right to vote before those in the United States. The similarities of the German mindset in the 1930s and the American mindset of today is breathtaking. You see, Germans refused to believe that the Nazi party could have been worse than the communists in much the same way that the mainstream Republicans look at the socialist wing of the Democrat party, even ignoring that the Democrat platform is a full-throated embrace of socialist issues. And of course, in Germany, the socialists were the Nazi party. Read translated German newspapers from the 1930s, and you'll recognize that Germans had a false sense of security. 
believing that as the Nazi party began gaining a majority in the parliament, the Weimar Constitution protected the guaranteed freedoms enumerated in it, just as most believe that Joe Biden, Nancy Pelosi, and Chuck Schumer are bound by our Constitution. The people of Germany believed that the two separate democratically elected legislative bodies that made up German parliament was a clear force of accountability to those in power. It's the idea of separation of powers that our U.S. Constitution seemed to have perfected. Amazingly, few today seem to recognize that the Nazi party didn't form a coup to take over the German government. No, they rose to power through election. Now that the Democrats have control of both the White House and both houses of Congress, they have already broadcast their iron-fisted intention of absolute control of government. First, by making Washington, D.C. and Puerto Rico states of our union. Now, these are solidly Democrat states, if they become states. Washington, D.C. voted 93% for Joe Biden, and Puerto Rico had a close gubernatorial race between the new Progressive Party candidate who edged out the Democrat. Do you know what it takes to add a state to our union? It's a simple majority vote of Congress. This action will create four new Democrat members to the United States Senate, and because both are solid Democrat strongholds, eliminate the possibilities that Republicans will ever gain another majority. The final assault against our free nation will come with the addition of at least four more members to the United States Supreme Court, all of whom will be nominated by Joe Biden and confirmed by the Democrat-controlled U.S. Senate, since Vice President Harris has the power to break any tie in the 50-50 Senate. One of the founders of our country and fourth president of the United States, James Madison, said the accumulation of all powers, legislative, executive, and judiciary, in the same hands, whether of one, a few, or many, and whether hereditary, self-appointed, or elective, may justly be pronounced the very definition of tyranny. In 1932, six years before the Second World War, the Nazi Party became the majority in Parliament. Not only did they adopt new rules that limited minority party actions and inhibited dissent, they took formal actions against opposing members to cripple them. Democrats are enacting their revenge on Republicans that dared challenge the Electoral College vote in as many as five states for President Joe Biden's 2020 election, are working to blackball the dissenters by keeping their names off any legislation that has a chance of becoming law. Better yet, the very same Democrats who did the very same thing in 2000, 2004, and 2016 want Republicans charged with sedition. During the January 2001 session to certify the 2000 electors, Sheila Jackson Lee, the member of Congress who asked the staff of the Mars Pathfinder Operations Center if the Mars rover was going to visit the site Americans planted the flag, said that millions of Americans were disenfranchised by Florida's inaccurate vote count, and Maxine Waters characterized Florida's electoral votes as fraudulent. Their claims were so contrived that no U.S. senator would join them to force a debate on the floor. Democrats were more aggressive when attempting to thwart the certification of the 2004 electors when Senator Barbara Boxer joined Representative Stephanie Tubbs-Jones to lodge a formal objection to Ohio's electoral votes, which compelled Congress to spend two hours in debate, even though George W. Bush won Ohio by more than 118,000 votes, where the only ballots by mail were absentees from voters that requested them. Now, To put that in perspective, Republicans challenged ballots mailed unsolicited to voters where Biden won Nevada by just 3,000 votes, Arizona by 11,000, Georgia by 12,000, Wisconsin by 20,000, and Pennsylvania by 81,000 votes. But back in the, the debate to challenge the 2004 results, Representatives Barbara Lee claimed that the Democrat process was thwarted. Gerald Nadler of New York said that the right to vote was stolen, and I'm quoting. And of course, Mrs. Waters weighed in too, focusing her objection to the documentary filmmaker Michael Moore, whose 2004 movie, Fahrenheit 9-11, painted a dark picture of the Bush presidency. In 2017, after Donald Trump's victory, 
Democrats in Congress once again challenged the election outcomes. Democrat Representative Jim McGovern of Massachusetts cited con the confirmed and illegal activities engaged by the government of Russia. Ms. Lee of California argued that Michigan's electoral votes should be thrown out because people are horrified by the overwhelming evidence of Russian interference in our election and also cited the malfunction of 87 voting machines. Democrats in the House filed objections against the votes in at least nine states. However, as in 2000, no senator would sign on to any of the objections, which led Maxine Waters from the floor of a joint session of Congress to call out, is there one U.S. senator who will join me in this objection? But now, in the wake of the 2020 elections, where Republicans made challenges to the certification of five states that in my opinion, were worthy of consideration, on her official website, Maxine Waters raged against them, writing, Trump and congressional Republicans continue to display their disdain for the Constitution by challenging the Electoral College vote count while the world watches in horror. On the day of the joint session of Congress, she told reporters, today some Republicans in the House and Senate will make a mockery of our democracy and their attempts to undo the will of the people. The very thing she engaged in three times before. Evangelist Billy Sunday once said, many a man who tries to talk as if he were standing on a mountain shows by what he says that he is up to his eyes in mud. The irony of me using this quote will be the response from the left who will most assuredly focus on Sunday's use of personal pronouns and not the fact that every Democrat that has set out to destroy Republicans epitomize this quote. It's also breathtaking to recognize that the Nazi propaganda machine ensured that the public received a consistent dose of disinformation with the aid of Germany's largest public and private publications and media outlets, which all but eliminated op opposing points of view. Sound familiar? It was Article 48 of the Weimar Constitution that was the ultimate linchpin to Hitler progressing from chancellor to dictator, which allowed the president to suspend civil rights and operate independently in an emergency. Now, of course, our Constitution has no such article, and yet the COVID pandemic demonstrates that our local, state, and national government has seized powers in direct contradiction to the very document that is supposed to constrain the powers of government and protect us all from it. Remember that the Constitution was made for the people, not the people for the Constitution. In addition to establishing the manner in which our government functions, it was designed to prevent government from overstepping its bounds and intruding into the lives of citizens. As another founding father and third president of the United States, Thomas Jefferson said, when the people fear the government, there is tyranny. When the government fears the people, there is liberty. The fact that here in America, government at any level assumed power and authority that is not enumerated in the Constitution of the United States, which denied commerce inside the borders of this nation, while at the same time denied citizens the very rights guaranteed in the Bill of Rights, like the right to peacefully assemble, exercise religion, should send a chill through the blood of every American patriot. Let me make this point very clear. Even if the actions taken by government did, in fact, reduce the spread of the pandemic and was in the best interest of the people, the precedent this action set opens a Pandora's box of unlimited government intrusion that I see as catastrophic as what occurred in Germany in the 1930s. This is because the door is now wide open for officials and government to take action against the liberties of Americans based solely on the premise that doing so is in the best interest of the people for their protection. Our founding fathers knew the dangers of unrestrained government, which is why boundaries within the Constitution were written to constrain government and not the people. However, because fewer Americans understand the history that leads to bondage, few understands how inexorably linked government growth is to tyranny. As President Ronald Reagan warned us, as government expands, 
liberty contracts. But the Democrat mindset is the exact opposite. Their view of government is a benevolent force that's focused on doing good to ensure equality of outcome for all people. Ironically, Nobel Prize winning economist Milton Friedman believed that too until he started taking a closer look at how history exposed the fallacious nature of this mindset and concluded that the society that puts equality before freedom will end up with neither. The society that puts freedom before equality will end up with a great measure of both. Here's our new vice president, Kamala Harris, propagating what I consider to be the linchpin to a nation driving itself into bondage. So there's a big difference between equality and equity. Equality suggests, oh, everyone should get the same amount. The problem with that, not everybody's starting out from the same place. So if we're all getting the same amount, but you started out back there and I started out over here, we can get the same amount, but you're still going to be that far back behind me. It's about giving people the resources and the support they need so that everyone can be on equal footing and then compete on equal footing. Equitable treatment means we all end up at the same place. In the Critique of Gotha program written in 1875, Karl Marx argued from each according to his ability to each according to his needs, which is the fundamental principle of Marxism. Marxism, like Leninism and Nazism, is positioned as the answer to greed, which they argue is the fatal flaw of humanity. I think the best person to refute this notion is the late Milton Friedman, who in, 19, in the 1970s shared why this philosophy is fallacious on the Phil Donahue Show. When you see around the globe the maldistribution of wealth, the, the desperate plight of millions of people in underdeveloped countries, uh, when you see so few haves and so many have-nots, when you, when you see the greed and the concentration of power within, don't, aren't you ever... Did you ever have a moment of doubt about capitalism and whether greed's a good idea to run on? Well, first of all, tell me, is there some society you know that doesn't run on greed? You think Russia doesn't run on greed? You think China doesn't run on greed? What is greed? Of course, none of us are greedy. It's only the other fellow who's greedy. <laughs> this, the world runs on individuals pursuing their separate interests. The great achievements of civilization have not come from government bureaus. Einstein didn't construct his theory under order from a, from a, a bureaucrat. Henry Ford didn't revolutionize the automobile industry that way. In the only cases in which the masses have escaped from the kind of grinding poverty you're talking about, the only cases in recorded history are where they, where they have had capitalism and largely free trade. If you want to know where the masses are worth, worse off, worst off, it's exactly in the kinds of societies that depart from that. So that the record of history is absolutely crystal clear that there is no alternative way so far discovered of improving the lot of the ordinary people that can hold a candle to the productive activities that are unleashed by a free enterprise system. But it seems to reward not virtue as much as ability to manipulate the system. And what does reward virtue? You think the uh, communist commissar rewards virtue? You think a Hitler rewards virtue? You think, excuse me, if you'll pardon me, do you think American presidents reward virtue? Do they choose their appointees on the basis of the virtue of the people appointed or on the basis of their political clout? Is it really true that political self-interest is nobler somehow than economic self-interest? You know, I think you're taking a lot of things for granted. And just tell me where in the world you find these angels who are going to organize society for us. Well, I don't even trust you to do that. <laughs> Amen. As a free market conservative, I've defended the fundamental right of Facebook and Twitter to censor information that they don't like because both are private companies. Bottom line, no one is forcing you to become a member. I've argued that if we as conservatives don't like what Facebook and Twitter are doing, then we can leave and start our own form of Twitter or Facebook, which is exactly what the founders of Parler did. Parler quickly became the go-to place for those like me who actually believe that speech should be free and where, diverse, where a diverse set of opinions should be fostered. 
Parler membership blew up and became the fastest growing social media app in history. Returning once again to the former Marxist turned free market economist, the late Milton Friedman, said there is one and only one social responsibility of business to use its resources and engage in activities designed to increase its profit so long as it stays within the rules of the game, which is to say, engages in open and free competition without deception or fraud. The left likes to misquote Friedman by sharing only the first part of his quote, but like every fellow liberty-loving capitalist believes, Friedman was a free market economist who focuses on opportunity, not outcome, which should be based on a level playing field. With Twitter and Facebook censoring any post that contradicted the secular humanist philosophy of morality and relative truth, Parler became a platform that competed directly with Twitter, where, unlike Twitter, contrasting points of view could be advocated to a rapidly growing audience where each member had the power to select from which voices they wished to hear. Parler became a social media space where free expression was not limited, allowing content that was sometimes explicit and offensive, which ironically turned off many of its members for allowing. Yet the right to be offended illustrates well Thomas Jefferson's argument that it was far preferable to peaceful slavery. Yet it wasn't freedom to post explicit material, but the exercise of free expression of conservative ideas that led the Silicon Valley cartel to shut down Parler. Google and Apple removed the Parler app from their app stores in January 8th and 9th, respectively, which eliminated the ability of people to download the app. However, those of us who already had the app could still use it, and anyone could access Parler on their computer's web server. The coup d'etat occurred just two days later on January 11th. With just 24 hours notice, Amazon Web Services, the nation's largest web service provider, completely shut down Parler's web account in violation of their own service contract, which guaranteed no less than 30 days notice. It turns out that on December 22nd, just 20 days before they shut Parler down, Twitter signed a new hosting deal with Amazon. Amazon Web Services stated that the Parler app was used to incite the violence at the nation's capital, completely ignoring the fact that Facebook and Twitter have been the go-to places for the organizers of Antifa and Black Lives Matter to direct mobs of violent rioters, where innocent people were killed and maimed as rioters brazenly took over government buildings and destroyed hundreds of millions of dollars worth of property. Since Amazon Web Services, Google and Apple presented not a scintilla of evidence to demonstrate that the Parler app was any more a platform for inciting violence than Twitter or Facebook, their cooperative actions to take a 10-year-old private company down in just four days is a clear case of collusion, which is defined as a deceitful agreement or secret cooperation between two or more parties to limit open competition by deceiving, misleading, or defrauding others of their legal rights. It can be used to obtain objectives forbidden by law, for example, by defrauding or gaining an unfair market advantage. It is an agreement among firms or individuals to divide a market, set prices, limit production, or limit opportunities. Now, one would have to be irretrievably stupid not to recognize that antitrust laws are openly being violated and that these companies are true monopolies that should be broken up. However, If the Supreme Court is indeed stacked with more leftist ideologues who view the Constitution as an impediment to freedom rather than the most important safeguard of individual liberty, how will freedom of expression be protected in the future? Obviously, it won't. Anti-Semitism proliferated Germany because all channels of communication were cut off to those of opposing points of view, which is exactly what's happening in America today against anyone who dares advocate a conservative political opinion. Noted historian Karl Dietrich Brocker argued that the success of Nazi ideology can only be understood by recognizing the role of propaganda in the Third Reich. The Nazis' modern techniques of opinion formation in order to create a truly religio-philosophical phenomenon made the propaganda especially powerful. You see, the Jews had no similar platform to refute or rebut the misinformation propagated by the Nazi party. 
And whenever those outside of the Third Reich attempted to bring truth to light, they were the ones labeled as propagators of lies, misinformation, and hate. Sound familiar? On March 13, 1933, the Third Reich established a ministry of propaganda, appointing Joseph Goebbels as the minister to protect citizens from the lies of external enemies which had imposed the Treaty of Versailles on Germany and internal en enemies like the Jews, gypsies, homosexuals, and Bolsheviks. To boil a frog, you don't throw him into a bowling cauldron. You, you, you place him instead in a cool vat of cool water where heat is gradually introduced so that by the time he recognizes his peril, it's too late. He's already dead. The Nazis didn't make their plan for the world domination known as they were slowly gaining power in parliament. They began slowly to boil the proverbial frog. The first hint of their underlying objectives utilized Goebbels' public relations campaign to convince Germany of Polish aggression, which helped to justify the invasion of Poland. Technology reporter Kevin Roos wrote a February 2nd piece in the New York Times entitled, How the Biden Administration Can Help Solve Our Reality Crisis. He writes, Several experts I spoke with recommended that the Biden administration put together a cross-agency task force to tackle disinformation and domestic extremism, which would be led by something like a reality czar. That's right. The social media cartel are floating the idea of a new ministry of truth. History proves that power does indeed corrupt, and absolute power corrupts absolutely. I return to the fallacy propagated in American universities and government-run public schools that socialism just hasn't been executed correctly, that it will work if implemented properly without any consideration of human nature. The American left now has a sure and direct path to absolute power in government, flanked on one side by the useful idiots, to borrow from Lenin, of the lamestream media, and on the other by the silicone cartels. So the mirage of a utopian future that exists in the minds of those who voted to put Democrats in power is sure to end in dystopic reality. Freedoms that we have far too long taken for granted, like freedom of expression, no longer exist, which was not true just three months ago. Speech, or should I say conservative speech, is now considered to be violence. Biden's presidential inauguration stripped us from the freedom to protest the government. Now that speech in America is no longer protected, where the only point of view allowed in the mainstream media is that of the left, our government can now direct attention on being the wonderful big brother we've always wanted. An Orwellian dystopia seems all but inevitable. Last night was President Biden's first address to the nation since becoming president, where he spent most of his time taking credit for the direct actions of President Trump. Where not one single thing our new president has done has ever made any difference whatsoever in relation to the COVID pandemic, even though he never uttered the word COVID in his entire speech. But it's the last four minutes of his speech that punctuates how the left is boiling the proverbial frog that is American de democracy through loose fiscal policy that, as Wood Halsley projected, would end in inevitable collapse. Our national debt just surpassed $28 trillion. And yesterday, President Biden added to it by signing the $1.9 trillion bill dubbed the American Rescue Plan that had not one Republican vote in favor of it. Today, I signed into law the American Rescue Plan an historic piece of legislation that delivers immediate relief to millions of people, includes $1,400 in direct rescue checks, payments. That means a typical family of four earning about $110,000 will get checks for $5,600 deposited if they have direct deposit or in a check, a treasury check. Yeah, I want, I want to pause right here to highlight what the late, great Rush Limbaugh always told us, that you can't beat Santa Claus. 
Here's the president literally giving you thousands of dollars to go right into your bank account to take care of you and your family. This is the leader of our nation providing solutions that government, not the private sector, comes in to provide for and take care of Americans. Now, continuing where I cut him off, listen to his rhetoric, which has been promised by every dictator in history. It extends unemployment benefits. It helps small businesses. It lowers health care premiums for many. It provides food and nutrition, keeps families in their homes. And it will cut child poverty in this country in half, according to the experts. And if I, and it funds all the steps I've just described to beat the virus and create millions of jobs. <laughs> Government is cutting child poverty in half. Government is creating millions of jobs. How is child poverty being cut in half? It's not. We are the proverbial frog that he's boiling. After all, how could anyone reject the idea of cutting child poverty in half? And the millions of jobs he's creating? What kinds of jobs? Why government jobs, of course, which by their fundamental purpose create nothing but a greater burden on the private sector. It's not the public, but the private sector that creates goods and services, which is the lifeblood of the American tax system. What few in America seem to recognize is that every government worker that pays taxes isn't actually contributing to the income of the government. It's just giving back a portion of what the government has paid out to them. And don't forget that while private companies were forced to shut down and while millions of Americans in the private sector were forced into subsistence living because of it, every government employee has continued to be paid in full and receives every one of those government relief checks that is supposed to help the American worker in the private sector. Here's the most telling of all of Biden's rhetoric from last night's speech. Put trust and faith in our government to fulfill its most important function, which is protecting the American people. No function more important. Did you hear what he said? Put your faith and trust in government to protect the American people. And how do we do that? Well, by taking away their freedom. After Biden's speech, Tucker Carlson amplified this point by punctuating facts that are impossible to ignore. The Department of Defense has never been more aggressively or openly political. Tonight, there are 2,500 American troops stationed in Afghanistan, and they remain there to prevent the fall of Kabul to extremists. At the same time, there are 5,000 troops in our own capital tonight, also as protection against extremists, meaning people who voted for the losing candidate in the last election. Judging by those numbers, the Pentagon is now twice as focused on controlling our own citizens as it is on controlling the Taliban. Yeah, in last night's speech, Biden warned of the possibility that government may have to, once again, take away Americans' freedom for our own good. But don't forget, he's putting money in your bank account so you can trust him to do what's right. To protect you. My fellow frogs... That heat we're feeling right now is real, and it's a matter of time before we're boiling. Where exactly did President Biden say this $1.9 trillion was going to come from since we're already in debt by more than $28 trillion? Well, he answered that just a couple of months ago. Based on a simple premise, it's time to reward work, not just wealth in America. We're going to have a fair tax structure to make sure the wealthiest among us and corporations pay their fair share. Pay their fair share? Really? Amy Schles shares truth that's actually based on empirical facts that she shares on PragerU about what the rich actually pay in taxes. Politicians like being able to say that they are ensuring that the rich pay their share. And nothing proves their anti-rich credentials like sponsoring fresh legislation for more progressivity. So for years, president after president, Democrat and Republican, and Congress after Congress have passed law after law to make the income tax more progressive. President Richard Nixon signed a law that took 9 million taxpayers at the bottom end off the income tax staircase entirely. 
Other presidents, like Ronald Reagan and Bill Clinton, took a few more million out. George W. Bush removed even more. So today, nearly half of Americans pay no income tax at all. And 10% of earners pay 70% of all income tax. Talk about disproportionate. Here we get to a genuine question of fairness. There's something wrong with our democracy when people who pay no tax can vote for tax increases on fellow citizens who already do pay tax. So the $1.9 trillion program isn't going to be paid for by the rich after all. It's another loose fiscal policy that will, according to history, cause the inevitable end of our nation as we know it. The immutable law of numbers demonstrates that this exponential growth in debt is completely unsustainable. Many of our nation's founding fathers were men of faith who were influenced strongly by Judeo-Christian tradition. They accepted the premise of mankind's imperfect nature. They had experienced firsthand the oppressive dictates of the crown that led to the American Revolution. And they were rightly suspicious of the accumulation of governmental power by one person or a small body. Recall Madison, who described it as the very definition of tyranny. Consistent with these experiences and beliefs, the founders imbued liberty-preserving principles into the very structure of the new government. They divided power between federal and state governments, apportioned federal power among three branches of government, and limited the power of federal government to certain delegated functions. But the founders also knew that these devices alone were inadequate to preserve and sustain our new nation. John Adams provided us with the Achilles heel of our founding documents when he stated, Our Constitution was made only for a moral and religious people. It is wholly inadequate to the government of any other. Likewise, James Madison wrote that our Constitution requires sufficient virtue among men for self-government. Otherwise, nothing less than the chains of despotism can restrain them from destroying and devouring one another. Why did they believe that the success of the Union ultimately depended on the virtue of the people? Well, the founders intrinsically understood what was best articulated by the late Andrew Breitbart, that government runs downstream of culture. A virtuous people would courageously defend the rights endowed by their creator and restored by the blood of patriots. But a fearful people would readily cede these rights in exchange for a fleeting sense of security. As Princeton's Robbie George explains, people lacking in virtue could be counted on to trade liberty for protection, for financial or personal security, for comfort, for having their problems solved quickly. And there will always be people occupying or standing for public office who will be happy to offer the deal. This is why James Madison said, What is government itself but the greatest of all reflections on human nature? While the left is working to cover over history, the fact remains that the end of slavery came about because people of faith rose up to challenge the distorted mindset that was sanctioned into law, first in England, through the conviction of a member of Parliament's William Wilberforce's belief in the authority of God's Word that all human life was precious, that all men, regardless of race, were loved by our Creator, and he therefore saw African slaves not as objects and argued mercilessly against others who proclaimed to be Christians while they supported this inhumane act through their actions, words, and most especially, silent indifference. Here in America, Angelina Grimke, the daughter of a distinguished South Carolina slaveholders, increasingly became convinced that slavery was an immoral and unchristian system that denied human rights. She was one of the earliest and most ardent opponents of slavery, where she began writing for a prominent periodical, The Liberator, where in an effort to enlist Southern women in the cause, she penned her most famous piece, Appeal to Christian Women of the South, which helped convince people that the overwhelming thrust of the Christian and American duty is the freedom of Africans. Her words influenced Republican President Abraham Lincoln to fight Congress for the emancipation of slaves. She wrote, The doctrine of blind obedience and an unqualified submission to any human power, whether civil or ecclesiastical, is the doctrine of despotism and ought to have no place among Republicans and Christians. It is impossible to ignore the consistent fundamental principle about the Republican Party, which is 
the focus on individual freedom and liberty, while still today Democrats focus on keeping people in chains in whatever capacity is necessary to keep them in power. The slaves of today come by a different name altogether. They're called Democrats, dependent on government for solutions to all their woes. God ordained three institutions in this order, the family, the church, and government. Unfortunately, the overwhelming reality in America today is that the family and the church have ceded their responsibilities to government. Is it too late for the family and the church to rebound and reinstate the principles of teaching and training each new generation, the virtues without which free societies cannot survive? Basic honesty, integrity, self-restraint, concern for others and respect for their dignity and rights, civic-mindedness and the like. Unless the family and the church start to stand up and speak out, the structural constraints of our Constitution will fail. We need those constitutional constraints on government to never come unbound in order to protect in order to protect liberty. We need to explain to young people why that liberty is vital to the success of our country and to inculcate the virtue needed to resist a culture of immediate gratification. One of the worst things we can do is try to bring in young people into the Republican Party before they understand why the values set forth in the Republican platform are so important. There are few elected officials today who fight vigorously for freedom and liberty anymore, even though we have so many Republicans in office. The three most notable that have demonstrated through their actions, their commitment to upholding liberty and freedom are U.S. Senator Ted Cruz, State Senator Bob Hall and Texas State Party Chairman Lieutenant Colonel Allen West. It's why I've put them in the Bunker Bob Conservative Hall of Fame. Unsurprisingly, all of these men openly share their faith in Jesus Christ as the source of their strength to stand strong in the face of unrelenting opposition, especially from fellow Republicans who are bent on compromise, wholly focused on either getting reelected or becoming a big tent party without standards. The Republican Party of Texas has been desperate for the kind of leadership that Alan West is now providing. West is not focused on building a bigger party. He's focused on educating those already inside the party about the foundational fundamental principles of what makes our party the best hope for our state and our nation. The better equipped we as Republicans are to understand the strength of our principles spelled out in our party platform, the better able we will be to attract freedom-loving patriots inside our party. Chairman West has been an active leader for conservative principles for decades, and, and using his experience in the military and as a congressman to equip others to fight against the left's assault against our freedom and liberty has been refreshing. West is asking Texas now to be the storm, as opposed to sitting back in apathy and indifference as our nation runs back into bondage. What's becoming more apparent is that American ignorance, apathy, and indifference are a clear and present danger nationally, statewide, and locally as well. Why are so many Republicans content to ignore that throughout his entire presidency, 90% of news coverage about President Trump was negative, propagated by a press that unapologetically expressed open disdain for him. The source of news for far too many Republicans today comes through the mainstream media, and many still embrace the idea that the news they are getting is somehow objective, that to listen to conservative voices like Mark Levin, Ben Shapiro, Stephen Crowder, Larry Elder, Sean Hannity, or the late great Rush Limbaugh, Maha Rushi to most of us. To them, conservatives are somehow less reliable than what spews forth from the mouths of blatant left leftists thinly disguised as journalists. Most Americans let others in the media do their thinking for them. After all, the press no longer reports the news. They tell you what to think about it. 
Since their only source of news comes from the mainstream press, where they are bombarded by daily reports that vilified and demonized President Trump, it's understandable why so many of these people hold an unfavorable attitude toward him. But that's just one part of the effort to destroy President Trump. The other included marginalizing Trump supporters in the same way the Nazi propaganda machine of the 1930s demonized people in order to discredit their opinions and turn them into social pariahs. Jews were not just despised, but feared as an alien race that fed off the host nation, poisoned its culture, seized its economy, and enslaved its workers and farmers. Sound familiar? It's the same kind of rhetoric spewing forth from the mainstream media today. They want you to believe that Donald Trump is the second coming of Satan because his temperament is so off-putting. In spite of the Democrat attempts to overturn the election of Donald Trump through a bogus impeachment that lasted throughout his presidency, which produced overwhelming evidence that contradicted their baseless allegation, the left continues the false narrative that Donald Trump colluded with Russians to defeat Hillary Clinton. Many Republicans actually believe that Trump's January 6th speech before hundreds of thousands of freedom-loving, law and order supporters incited a mob mentality which resulted them in storming the Capitol. Because most have still today never actually listened to his speech because the national media shows you only what they want you to see. In fact, it's almost impossible to to find the following portion of Trump's speech on YouTube. Thanks to big tech cartel making decisions about what is and what is not appropriate, regardless of how true something may be. Watch what few in America have ever seen or heard. Now it is up to Congress to confront this egregious assault on our democracy. And after this, we're going to walk down, and I'll be there with you. We're going to walk down. We're going to walk down anyone you want, but I think right here, we're going to walk down to the Capitol. And we're going to cheer on our brave senators and congressmen and women. And we're probably not going to be cheering so much for some of them, because you'll never take back our country with weakness. You have to show strength and you have to be strong. We have come to demand that Congress do the right thing and only count the electors who have been lawfully slated, lawfully slated. I know that everyone here will soon be marching over to the Capitol building to peacefully and Patriotically, make your voices heard. Today, we will see whether Republicans stand strong for integrity. How many people have seen that? Not very many. The Bible tells us men love to have their ears tickled. They want to be embraced by the warm feelings of hope for the future, regardless how untrue, than to hear the callously sterile truth. After all, only a fool gets angry at a doctor who shares bad news accurately. Regardless your opinions about the manner in which the 2020 elections were carried out, and despite the left-wing echo chamber of the mainstream press or the all-out assaults against free speech by tech media behemoths like Facebook, Twitter, Google, and Amazon against anyone who dares to hold an opinion that stands in contrast with their intolerant hardline standards of leftist political propaganda, it's time to wake up to the reality that history is indeed repeating itself as our country slips back into inevitable bondage. The fact is, more than 77 million people in America voted against a president whose actions curtailed the powers of government, which demonstrates his desire to hand citizens more freedom and liberty to make choices that few outside our nation ever have. Instead, this mass of voters chose to install a government that, should their agenda stay on track, make them more dependent on government than ever before. The inauguration of Joe Biden was the symbolic moment that America crossed the line from apathy into dependence. The fact that our healthcare system has already been taken over by government, as we have now elected a president and vice president who are full-throated advocates of the Green New Deal agenda, which will accelerate the dissolution of the private sector and increase the size and scope 
of government aided by left-wing echo chamber of the mainstream media where just one political narrative is permitted. It's time for those of us who consider ourselves to be freedom-loving patriots to recognize that freedom and liberty in America is being stripped from us at breakneck speed. Is Atlas about to shrug? Does anyone doubt the cultural mindset that refuses to believe that Joe Biden, Kamala Harris, Nancy Pelosi, or Chuck Schumer are guided by evil intent? Most choose to believe that these, the most powerful government operatives in America today, genuinely care about the American people and that their motives have nothing whatsoever to do with a sadistic thirst for power. Most Americans don't want to believe in the depravity of mankind. Let's face it. The foundational Bible passage found in Romans 3.23 that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God is anathema to America, to the modern American mindset, and worst of all, America's churches have all but ripped out passages that are off-putting to the world in hopes that the Christian church will be more culturally acceptable and thereby more appealing to those on the outside. And what's the result? Those inside the church are not prepared to battle forces of darkness because God's Word, which is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword and piercing as far as the vision of soul and spirit of both joy and tomorrow and able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart, is not being preached or taught. This is why there are so many self-righteous Christian hypocrites on social media who spew some of the most offensive attacks towards those who dare stand for truth that contradicts culture. These social media trolls get special satisfaction misusing Bible passages to demonize, not the argument, but the person making it, and often write things like, you say you're a Christian, but Jesus would never support, or Jesus was love, so you have to accept others, and on and on and on. Worse still are those Christians who tell me about how much they just hate Donald Trump because of his personality. I had one idiot tell me he's never met a woman who liked Donald Trump. When I highlight all that Donald Trump has accomplished as president, they begrudgingly acknowledge those things, but come right back to personality. When people say, we need to be more like Jesus, we need to demonstrate love like Jesus. If we could just behave more like Jesus, if Donald Trump would just act like, like, more like Jesus, people would embrace us more. Um, you, you know, no one acted more like Jesus than Jesus. And did people love him? He was crucified. To all those self-righteous Christians, the world is a dark place because it hates the light. Not because the light is bad, but because they hate the light. The world hates truth, and no matter how nicely you say it, people will always hate it. My pastor, Todd Wagner likes to say, truth sounds like hate to those who hate the truth. That's why he also says, tolerance where people are concerned is a blessing, but tolerance where truth is concerned is a tragedy. Instead of bringing light to a dark world, the American church is a feckless remnant of what God designed us to be. It's important to remember that light is not the absence of darkness. Darkness is the absence of light. If the body of Christ were lifting up the light of the world, how could our nation today stand in utter, utter darkness? In Corinthians, Paul instructs us to be in the world, but not of the world. But so many of those who profess Christ as Savior spend more time on social media taking pictures of their food than standing on righteousness and speaking truth. I think that if Christians today were to rank the order of influencers in their life, few of those influencers are driving them to be more fully devoted followers of Jesus Christ versus those that are driving them to feed on the altar of secular humanism. I unashamedly rank my pastor, Todd Wagner, as one of the greatest influencers in my life because he drives me to walk in a manner worthy of the gospel of Jesus Christ through his words, but most especially through his actions. I even named my dog Wagner in his honor. That's not, that's not a joke, and I've never told him that. I, I see Todd as the modern version of the great Dietrich Bonhoeffer, especially since the American church finds ourselves in the same place today as the Church of Germany was back then, back in 1930. Because so few know history, most are unaware that the Church of Germany didn't just tolerate but embraced Nazism. 
Many high-ranking Nazi leaders were members of the Church of Germany when, the, when Pastor Dietrich Bonhoeffer stood up and spoke out against it, charging church leaders with heresy. Not only was he despised by church leaders and many Christians inside the church for daring to address politics, he was eventually executed for his steadfast, undying commitment to truth, hung by piano wire for his involvement in the Valkyrie effort to assassinate Hitler. I just wonder, how, how many pastors today speak out against the normalization of sin in America? How many of them would go so far as to lead their congregations to fight against governmental despotism and tyranny as Bonhoeffer did? Just check out Todd Wagner's Facebook and Twitter accounts and you'll see that he infuriates people. Not because he posts inflammatory rhetoric, but because he's willing to speak the truth in love on a platform that hates the truth. One of my all-time favorite things Todd has ever said from the pulpit was spoken just two weeks ago where he said, pansies in the pulpit do not create the aroma of Christ in the pew. A pansy is a delicate flower that withers in the heat. You know, there was one thing Rockwall County has plenty of, and that's churches. And I can say unreservedly that the one thing that our community does not need is another church. What our community does need are men and women of faith who are willing to stand up to the feckless church. That's the body of Christ. That are like whitewashed tombs, beautiful on the outside, but completely dead inside. Rockwall County is one of the most affluent counties in the state of Texas, but its families are literally dying inside because their hope is in their prosperity and not in God. People are desperate for truth, which I believe God's word wholly contains. But they also need leaders who are willing to stand strong where the Bible is strong and flexible where it is flexible. Leaders who are not trying to be loved and adored, but who, st who stand strong on the convictions of their beliefs. Rockwall County, and Texas for that matter, needs a church that is preparing them for battle where we are equipped to take action that may result in being ridiculed, castigated, hated, despised, or even killed because we are unafraid to speak the truth and call out those false prophets who are engaging in the very thing that the Church of Germany embraced when they engaged with the Nazi party. Whether or not you believe that the Bible is God-breathed, one cannot come away from reading it without recognizing that it is profitable for teaching, correction, reproof, for training in righteousness, so that a man who follows its teachings may be ready, equipped for every good work. America has bought into the lie that people are fundamentally good, which has led most to embrace the fallacy that good intentions eclipse outcomes and results. Of course, as the Weimar Constitution demonstrated, the culture of Germany was much more open and tolerant than the Nazi propaganda proclaimed. What made it possible for the Nazi doctrine to capture the hearts and minds of the people were not its most vocal advocates, but those who opposed the Nazi doctrine, but chose to remain silent and sat by as the rights and liberties of fellow Germans were slowly eroded. Visit the National Holocaust Museum in Washington, D.C., and you'll find the words of Pastor Martin Niemöller who, like many Protestant leaders, had refused to believe the evil that was right in front of them and enthusiastically welcomed the Third Reich and their church. Following the war, Niemöller wrote, first they came for socialists and I did not speak out because I was not a socialist. Then they came for the trade unionist and I did not speak out because I was not a trade unionist. Then they came for the Jews and I did not speak out because I was not a Jew. Then they came for me, and there was no one left to speak for me. The hope of our nation is not found in our nation or state's capital buildings, but in the family and in the church that is willing to stand up for and protect truth, justice, and what once was the American way. As our nation dives headfirst into bondage, I believe that God's people must act faithfully, not in ourselves, but in the goodness and power of Christ alone. Are you ready and willing to stop being silent, my fellow Texans, my fellow Americans? I hope so. Until next time, I'm Bunker Bob Steinhagen, urging you to remember that a Republican does not a conservative make, so be on guard. Until next time, blessings.